Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We got a lot of ground to cover, and um, I just didn't stand up here and joke around all afternoon, but we got heavy, heavy stuff to cover, and, and, I, and we've done one, two, and three this morning, and you know, that thing about three, it's funny, when I talked about the big book taking a big right turn on page 60, I missed it for 17 years. I talked about this a little bit last night, but if I take a guy right from are you willing to believe to let's get down our knees and do the third step prayer, I can wind up working a program based on abstinence from alcohol and, you know, where the whole deal is about not drinking. And I miss this whole piece. It's not really very important except for that what Katie talks about. It lays out the root of our problem, you know, the whole basis of the rest of our work and what we're going to do. It was big news to me that the problem in alcoholism wasn't alcohol. Somebody with a problem with alcohol can just stop drinking, but a problem with alcoholism is, it turns out, it's all driven by this selfishness and self-centeredness, which is at the root of my problem, and it says, above everything, we have to be rid of this selfishness. Mark Houston used to like to look you right in the eye, and he'd go, what does above everything mean to you? You know, I mean... It doesn't say above everything I got to stop drinking vodka. Above everything I got to get a job and a car and a girlfriend. It, you know, it says above everything I got to be rid of this selfishness, because it turns out that alcohol was my what I used to treat my problem. Alcohol was the only thing that I ever found that would treat the pain of trying to live a life based completely on self. And the levels of self we were talking about Thursday night at my kitchen table. It's just like. The guys are just going, my God, the level of self in us is so blinding. And like Katie was saying, the reason I can't, I can see self in in somebody else, but the reason I can't see it in me is because it's filtered through my motives, which are always just wonderful. I'm trying to create utopia for everybody. And my delusion. So when you jump, I can't see how I'm being selfish. How could that be selfish, trying to make life wonderful? For everybody, you know, and that's why, you know, so when we roll in, and it was, that's why that line was such a big one to me when it said, the first requirement is that I be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a, a, a success. Like, what? And I didn't see that line for a long time. And I'd, consequently, I'd worked a program based on not drinking. And I'd done the, conf- the confessional style fourth step where it's going to make me feel better, and when I feel better, I won't have to drink. And then six and seven, we're just, you just kind of phone those in, you know. I mean, they're just this big, you know, it didn't touch me. And then eight and nine is so I won't feel uncomfortable out in the world, and then I won't have to drink. I mean, you hear a little selfishness in this in this form of the program. I had no idea what the problem was. So, and you know the guy, you know, I become that guy that's going, well, you know, uh, I left I went to work a two hours, screamed at my wife on the way out of the house and slapped a couple of the kids and kicked the dog and I got to work an hour and a half late and then I looked at two hours of internet porn while I was at the office and left to work an hour early and gambled for an hour and a half on the internet. And uh, But I didn't drink today and that makes me a winner. <laughs> you know, and you're like... No, that kind of makes you a nimrod, you know, uh, but... but, but but that was the deal, you know? And so when we when this program becomes about reduction of self and removing what's blocking me from this power, if I believe and hear that this power is my only shot, if I really believe, when I talk about step one driving everything, when we've had that step one experience, it's going to drive me through the rest of the work for at least 25 years. That's all I can testify to. You know, it, it will carry you through the rest of the work. Do I really believe to take an inventory has anything to do with whether I drink or not. Do I believe that making amends, all of my amends, has anything to do with whether I get drunk or not? Do I really believe that it's important to pray and meditate? Or do I think it's something I can do without, you know, and I can stay sober without it? I always say, if you want to see what I really believe, don't listen to what comes out of my mouth. Watch my feet. 
You want to see what I really believe? Watch my feet. You'll see what I believe. Do I act like a guy that believes he's convinced that his life run on self-will can hardly be a success? So what we're going to transition into now, and it's funny, I don't know how I miss, you know when I talked about how I used to read the book and look for things that I agree with? And everything else, you just kind of go, eh. they just you know go go right over here like this. That so, what did I used to do when I'd read that sentence that says the first requirement is that I be convinced that my life run on self will can hardly be a success. Just kind of yeah. next sentence, please. You know, you, you know. And then when you start really believing that, look at what it talks about that we're about to do in the fourth step. And I'm going to let Katie and Chris do the fourth step. I was just supposed to get up and do the seventh tradition and. Open us up. But look at what it says. You know, we talked about, you get a lot of re- people saying, well, Katie and I were doing a workshop up in uh, New Jersey. And this woman said, are you some of those people that uh, believe in working through the steps really fast? I was like, no, I mean, not really fast. I mean, a week, you know, three days, a month. I don't know what it, what it depends on time constraints, but... If you look at the way the book rolls it out, I don't see a lot of places where it talks about Stalin. And it, you know, and it, I mean, for example, the book has promised me. It says later on, clear-cut directions are given, showing how we have recovered. Right? How did we do it? And then, so if it's promising me clear-cut directions, look at what it says. After this third step, it talks about it, and then it says, "Is there any timing reference on when to do the fourth step?" There's two. It says, next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, that third step decision, vital and crucial, it says it could have little permanent effect unless at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. So in my mind, you can do it next, or at once, or anywhere in between, you know, I, you know so, yeah, and still be going by the book. Well, what are we doing in this strenuous effort? We're going to try to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking me. If you're telling me that my only solution is this power, what's between me and this power? I usually draw up a little pipeline up there, and I got me on one end and God on the other, except my pipe is full of junk. It's full of resentment. It's full of fear. It's full of self. It's full of guilt and remorse. And what we're going to try to do in this is just remove enough of what's blocking me so that it can be some contact between me and this power. You know? So when we're talking about a self, it says it's a fact-finding, a face-finding, fact-facing process. I'm going to let Katie and them talk about that. But listen to this. I don't know how a dope like me could miss the self piece for so long. And I used to feel really embarrassed about it until I figured out I'm not the only one that did it. You know, as I go around the country, I've had people come to me and go, my God, when you said the book takes the right turn on page 60, I had to go back to my room and read it last night. I had never seen that. And, it, and what does it say here? It says, but I mean, what did I used to do when I would read lines like, being convinced that self manifested in various ways, was what had defeated me. Am I convinced of that? Am I convinced that self showing up in various ways is what had defeated me? And if I am, it says, we considered its common manifestations. So we're back to self. Remember we talked about what manifestations mean, the way something shows up. So when you look at it like that, the fourth step is a consideration of manifestations of self. If you're telling me that self is the problem, I don't know what that means. What are you talking about? How does it show up? What is it, you know, when you say self, it's kind of nebulous to me, but what is it, how does it show up? And then it says, resentment is the number one offender. You know, and that's what what we're looking at here, are manifestations of self, and we're trying to remove what's blocking me from this power. I'm going to turn it over to these guys. Who's going first? Well, I don't want, you know, I mean, I'm rolling, but Katie is so good at this stuff, too. I don't let Katie roll it, because we're going to try to cover four, five, six, and seven. But I just think, I'm just going to say one quick thing. Is it at this, 
<laughs> Have you heard that one before? I, I, <laughs> we were doing a workshop. She'd pass over a little piece of paper. It goes, 10 minutes. And then I'd go a little further. It'd go, five minutes. And I keep talking. And she's going, I look at it and says, you're done. <laughs> yeah. I think I've gone out to this treatment center a lot. And a lot of times they'll go, hey, man, would you come out and hear my fifth step? And I go, absolutely not. I won't come out and hear your fifth step. I'll come out and do the first five steps with you. But there's no way that I'm going to assume that you understand what the problem is in step one, that you know what we're looking for in step two, that you understand what the deal is in step three, that i got to quit playing God and that my problem is self, and that I, you know, if I stay close to him and perform his work well, all that stuff that Kay was talking about, and then I've done a proper fourth step, and I know what I'm looking for in the fourth step, and then I'm ready for a fifth step. Because, you know, if you just say, yeah, I'll come out and hear your fifth step, you're liable to walk into anything. You know, you walk into a life story, you walk into, you know. So I'm real big on the, the way this program flows. And the more time I spend in this book and then I spend working with the guys, the more I really like to look at the flow of this program. And it seems to be, a bit, step one is almost like this ski jump and then it just kind of boom from there. You know, it's once I understand the real problem and the depth of the problem, that's going to catapult me into the rest of the work. And so... That's where we're at here in this in this fourth step, and then, um, but I think if I don't understand what that real problem is, and it's a you know the, there's there's a treatment center that we work with, and the, you know it's real important that the guys do the first five steps before they get out of there. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen guys that are grinding away on a fourth step, and they don't have a clue what the deal is in step three, and they don't even really understand what the problem is in step one. You know, but they know they're supposed to be writing this inventory. And um, so I think this stuff, when you're working with a new person, is real important to lay out to them. Uh, Katie, you want to go next? Yeah, but I'm going to take a little while because I want to get some stuff in okay. I, uh, uh, first of all, I have got to tell you guys something so funny. The whole self piece, right? Now that we even have even more heightened awareness, you know, if I tell you to go out and and see uh, how many white cars are outside. The predominant color of a car is white. Did you guys know that? Just FYI. So all of a sudden you start looking around and you go, my God, there are white cars everywhere. Well, the white cars have always been there, but you just have heightened awareness. And that's usually what happens after these workshops. You, you're going to have heightened awareness of self. <laughs> I have to tell the sandwich. Okay, I'm standing there. In somebody's seat. Now, I kind of, one moment, know I'm in somebody's seat. But I'm talking to two guys intently about the work, right? And this gal comes up, and she sets a sandwich down, and she looks at both the guys. I observe that, and uh, and sets the sandwich down. And I have finished my sandwich, and so, you know, we're all talking, talking, talking. And I really wanted to get another sandwich, and I saw that sandwich sitting there. And I looked, and I said, it, did she bring that for either of you two? And they go, no. And I thought, oh brought it for me. <laughs> and so I start to eat the sandwich. She walks up, she goes, are you eating my sandwich? <laughs> it never occurred to me that that was her sandwich, that that was even her chair. Do you see that? And that I mean, I, I just, well, well, if it isn't for you two, it's clearly for me. <laughs> and oh my God, when she said, are you eating my sandwich? I mean, all of a sudden you just go, Oh my God, it never even occurred to me that that would have been your chair and your sandwich. It's unbelievable. Thank God she was so kind. Um, so, uh, okay, I, I just want to say that the four step, oh my gosh, you guys, page 64 is so powerful. It is so powerful. In everything it's going to tell us about this four step. You know, you can get down to uh, this one statement this guy once said, you're picking the black out of the pepper. It, we didn't really like that statement when he said it to us, but I'm going to say it to y'all. Uh, is that this page is so power pack full of, of uh, study information, clear cut direction, all of that stuff. But don't get too crazy to where you're picking the black out of the pepper. But the bottom line here is, there are several things it says. Charlie just talked about um, uh, the inventory process is about a fact-finding, fact-facing mission. That is the searching and fearless. Fact-finding, searching, fact-facing, fearless. Because what we're getting ready to do is we're getting ready to uncover some bad, bad, bad trash about us. 
Yes. Or, or this is not about feeling good. This is a life or death errand. This is damn serious business. This is not about me getting in there and going, well, I know you didn't mean to hurt their feelings. The truth is, is we're getting ready to uncover some ugly behaviors, some ugly belief systems, some old ideas. You can call them what you want. The book says old ideas, prejudice, belief systems, whatever you want. But that's what we're getting ready to get down to. And it says that this is what has been blocking us. And I use the same terminology as Charlie. And the truth is, is, is uh, I mean, you could even really kind of get gross here and talk about uh, colon blockage, right? That's the problem. Right? Constipation. Serious problem. As a matter of fact, it can kill you. Can if that toxin backs up. That stuff is toxic. That's the exact same thing that resentment. That's the same thing that's blocking us. It's toxic. It's so toxic that if you've been sober a while, you'll actually kill yourself. Because your pride won't let you drink. That's some bad blockage, man. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what we're talking about here. And so what is that the colon, honey? <laughs> it's going to spare me and do, but you know what I'm talking about. So what we got to do is we got to get you unblocked, man. Because if you couldn't hear God, if He were sitting there with a bullhorn, you know, people are like, "Well, I, I mean, I don't understand this about God, and I don't understand this about God." And if you're trying to understand it, you're not going to. You're blocked. From it. Now, you may have moments of clarity. We all know what those look like, right? Where you have that moment of clarity. But we're talking about unblocking so that you get into these promises. Well, here's the other parts that, that, that are so uh, incredible. It says, this was the fourth step of business which takes no regular inventory. Right there, it's telling you, you don't get to take one inventory. The word regular and one are very different, yes? So you're going to be taking some inventories. And if we're talking about the new guy, which is kind of what this whole thing's geared to, we're going to take the new guy. For me, this is what I do with you. Uh, you you're doing an inventory within a two-week period. I'll tell you, you got one week. So I'll sit you down, and I do steps one, two, and three. It takes about an hour and a half, right? So I do steps one, two, and three with you. If a new guy is, is 24 hours sober or 48 hours sober, I don't say, well, let's hook up next week. Man, what a bullet to their head. What a, what a self-centered statement that is. You know what? I'm so busy. I'm going to, you know, baloney. You better be with that person within a 24-hour period, man. They have just asked you for help. My responsibility in Alcoholics Anonymous is to make that time for you or find somebody that can if I can't. And so I've got, I've got you. I sit you down. I do steps one, two, and three with you, right? Then I set you out on the, line you out on the fourth step, and I give you one week, and I only give you one week because I need a little bit of time to kind of work you into my schedule, right? Because I know we're going to sit down. It's going to be about a four-hour deal. And I can't just lob out four hours tomorrow. So I give you one week, but it's not going to take you the full week, right? And the truth is, is it's probably going to end up taking you three hours. And you're going to do those three hours the night before we have to meet. <laughs> Correct? And so uh, I give you that one week. And I say, when I'm doing steps one, two, and three with you lining out of the four step, I go, okay, we're going to meet Saturday at noon. There's no backing out. You back out, you will get a ration of shit from me. If you back out, if I put my world on hold to meet with you, you don't get to lob out, oh, my kids had a soccer game I had to go to, you know, or anything like that. And I let them know that ahead of time. And so we're going to sit down for a long talk, right? And, and another thing, i got to walk away from this for a sec. The best way to get a four-step, this is a colon. <laughs> That's not a colon. You got, you got a spiral notebook, right? You just open that notebook up, and you put a line here and a line here. Got it? And so that you've got four columns. That's all you need is four quick columns. The idea is to not do a lot of writing. So that you flip the page, and you have two more blank pages and a line and a line, right? And then you just be like, Mom, skip a line. Dad, skip a line. Instead of making a list, and the list is always written down, the list is not written. And so then you write your list of three things. And what are those three things? People, places, no, people, we're not, no, we're not going to now. People, and friction. There you go. So you write them all down, right? They go to CPS, IRS, uh, then make too much money. Huh. You don't make enough money. Yeah. And I actually end up with Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, fine. Oh, oh, gotta go back to the Okay. You only do all that stuff. 
okay, honey, you can be my banner. Okay. And uh, so, so th- that's how you're doing it, right? You're this is this. An inventory does not take that long. These people are like, well, I, I'm still working on my four step. I go, baloney. You're not working on your four step. You're not doing crap, right? You obviously are not driven by that first step or you'd be writing that thing and getting it done. Are, are you with me on that? I mean, we're not asking, we're not asking for war and peace here. We're just asking for you to write the darn deal. Now, it says in here under uh, Mr. Brown, listen to the three things that Mr. Brown had going on. It was his attention to his wife. How many of you guys are going to upset pretty badly? Oh, yeah, if any of you girls are hitting on my husband, it's going to be a problem, right? Okay. To- <laughs> Me? That is not true. Okay. Told my wife of my mistress, oh, my God. Is it, would you be upset if somebody went and did that? Yeah. And then Mr. Brown wants his job. The best AA t-shirt I've ever seen is that Mr. Brown needs his ass kicked. <laughs> is that the best? <laughs> but, I mean, and, and, and he got 19 words. I don't need you up there, honey. I'm sorry after all that. But you looked very cute. I did. He did look very cute. I know a, a woman could have done that job, but we needed a man. And uh, so, um, now, you know, I'm playing. Please hear that I am playing. I do have a lot of challenges behind all that stuff, but I am playing. Uh, so 19 words is what he got. See? Now, when we sit down for the long talk, these things are going to trigger plenty for us to talk about. But we're just talking bullet points is what we need here. Then the fourth column now, you get into, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the fourth step because we got to do four through seven, but I'm just going to kind of give it to you quickly. The, uh, uh, the new guy really struggles. I think everybody struggles with this, but especially the new guy. With what this terminology, uh, self-esteem, security, ambition, pride, personal relationships. I mean, did you guys wonder that? It's like, well, yeah, I guess that affected my self-esteem. I made me unhappy. I mean, I, I really didn't get that. And really, the, it's pretty simple, you know, that the, your self-esteem is how you see yourself. And so we kind of need to know how that affected you. How did, how did you see yourself in this circumstance? Your pride, how did, how did you think others saw you? Your security, what you want, your ambition, what you need, right? Or vice versa. Personal relationships, I love that one. That is belief systems. You know, men shouldn't, women should, children should always. You know, the government should. All of this stuff. And so that we're getting down to what are the causes and conditions. What is it that I believe that's got me so upset with my mother's behavior or my father's behavior? And the fourth column, which is the magic column, has got to make columns number two and three a lie. You've got to see a hypocrite, which is really what you're going to always see in the fourth column. How many of you guys held your parents absolutely accountable for certain parental behaviors they should have done? Because they're always the first two on your inventory, right? Mom and dad, immediately. However, if you sat your children down and they put you on there, you'd go, what the hell? What the hell, man? I did the best I could. Oh, but not my parents. See, it's all hypocritical. That's what we're looking for. We're just looking for the hypocrite that you better not treat me that way. Now, I can treat you this way, but you better not treat me that way. So it's such a devil standard, call the word, whatever you want. And uh, so the, the fifth step is where we, we bust through this deal. And uh, and I once again, too, I don't want to take up too much time uh, in, in talking about this, but, you know, when you're sitting down with a fear inventory, too, a fear inventory is pretty doggone simple. You're just looking for the um, self-reliance failure, the failure of self-reliance, right? And so the fear inventory is you write down the fear and why you had it. Isn't that it? You know why? Because everything's pretty much out of our control. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. You could lose your job next week. You know why? Your company could go under. You got any control over that? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. No, I don't. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about fear. So Charlie calls it a hula hoop, a sphere, Anything outside of here is out of my control. That's, you're just letting that 
you know, take off down the road. And and some people spend a lot more time in fear. I'm I'm kind of like Chris. He doesn't spend a lot of time in the second step. I don't spend a lot of time in fear. I mean, what what am I going to convince you not to be afraid? How well has that ever worked for you? Yeah, because I'm usually delusional. And then the sex inventory. This gentleman and I were having this conversation when I ate that girl sandwich um, <laughs> about the sex inventory and the sex inventory and the harms to others. Right? The 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 book can get a little wordy here and it and and I love Mark's take on it and it's my take too I get somebody to write a sex inventory however the book calls it a harms list also right and so the truth of the matter is is if you were, you're working with me you're going to do a, a resentment inventory a fear inventory and a sex inventory and then when you do an eight step you're going to do a harms list right you're going to make the the uh, uh, a men's list from from the eight in the eighth step. Some people do it in the uh, fourth step, but I, I I just think before you know it, the new guy's head's going to blow off. Man, he he he's just trying to absorb what he can, and I don't like to overwhelm him. I really believe it's 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 such a responsibility on my part to just kind of come on. Come on, walk through the door. Come on, come on. You can do it. You can do it. And then they get through the door, you know, and then they start seeing things and it clears away. But I just don't want to overwhelm them. And uh, so that's what I do. So the um, uh, page 75. Well, wait a second, wait a second. Before we go there, I wanted to say one other thing about um, on page 64. This is a common thing I see happen. And that is where it says that uh, a business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke, uh, blah, 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 blah. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock in trade. Yes, and we use an example of if you have a stereo store and you still have 8-track tapes on your shelf, you know, even though you love 8-track tapes, do we really think they're coming back? Okay, that, we need to move them on, right? We need to just move this stuff on. And it says one object is to disclose damage or unsaleable goods. Those eight tracks would be unsaleable goods. But it says to get rid of them promptly and without regret. Now, this is what I think happens. In an inventory, you are pretty self-righteous in your resentment. Wouldn't you agree? I have been done wrong. You know, this is how I have been done wrong. So you are completely self-righteous. Well, when you get to that fourth column, it is very easy to turn into self-pity. Oh, my God. I can't believe I've done it that way. Now that you show it to me that way, that's, God, I'm looking bad. I am really looking bad. Do you see that self-pity? Did most of y'all experience that? Yeah. So, and that line right there says, get rid of them promptly and without regret. You've just switched one, one level of self to another level of self. You just went from self-righteous to self-pity. We, we don't want you to be full of self-pity because you're of no use to anybody. You're still in self. And so it says it there, and it also says it over here on page um, 75. In the promises, <clears throat> second paragraph down, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I'm going to let you guys jump into 6 and 7. It says, we pocketed our pride and go to it, illuminating, it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. See, so if you have self-pity, you're not going to be delighted, right? So it's telling you right there, be very careful of that self-trap, that you step right out of self-righteous, right into self-pity, and it's still about you. Are you with me on that? And so whenever I'm working with the guy, man, I am beating that into him. Hey, 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 yo, 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 back it up. I'm seeing you looking at that as self-pity. We are going to uncover, discover, and take it to God in that hour, in that sixth step, right? That hour in the fifth step, and then in the sixth step, which, by the way, I like the terminology. I'm very much about semantics because I believe we need to keep this program whole for in 50 years and in 100 years. Are you with me on that one? Say yes. Yeah. So if we start muddying the waters with what step says what, in 100 years, this deal will be, you know, gone. And so the fifth step is about talking to another person about it, following through on that fourth column, and taking an hour. Then we go to six and seven. So most people say, well, I did my fifth step and went home to do six and seven. You're still completing the hour in the fifth step, yes? I think it's very important because we got to think about this in years to come. 
And so that's those are really my uh, my biggest deals. And this is the one that we're begin. It says in one of the promises that we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but we're going to have a spiritual experience. That's the first part of the book that says that. And I will caution you to tell the new guy. Let me tell you, buddy, your window's about this big right now. You're you're on you're cresting on a wave because of, of these promises. And these promises are great, right? We will be delighted. We'll be able to look the world in the eye. We'll be at perfect peace. We'll start to have a spiritual experience. And then what happens? They fizzle out, man. They don't do they don't do eight and nine. They they're they're on such a high, they're like going, My God, I did my fifth step, man, I'm feeling great. I've done my six and seven. And then they just stop and that window closes. And they're back pissed off at everybody again. You know what they want to do? Another inventory. Now, whose responsibility was that? I think it's the sponsor's responsibility. Damn sure is. You know, they go, well, I hadn't heard from them. Oh, oh, oh. So your phone doesn't call out? (laughs) Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I'm tough. I'm tough in that area. I'm like, whoa, yo, Terry, it's been three days. What the hell? Where are we on that inventory? You gonna tell? I mean, where are we on that amends? You gonna tell me you're still writing the letter? Bull. Oh, and I always take them back to step one. Either you got it or you don't. And I swear they, my sponsees always tell me, "Thank you, Katie." Now, come on, guys. How how hard is it for you to see my personality? People do not come to me because I'm touchy feely. They come to me because they know I'm going to be the one calling them going, I love you so much, I will ride your ass, right? I left my son in jail. I asked the judge to keep him in jail for 14 days. And that judge looked at me and goes, 14 days? was like, absolutely. I'm not taking that boy home. I am so pissed. And when I left out of there, I mean, I fell apart. Because that's called, the tough love is not for you. The tough love is because it's hard on me. To be that hard. See, we don't like taking these arrows. It hurts. But I, I care enough to be the one to say, okay, God, you picked me, I'll come do it. Okay, that's what I'm going to end on. Uh, Chris, covered alcoholic. If, uh, if anybody is doing the work, uh, this is the place that you're going to crap out, you know, and as, a, as a newcomer. Nine times out of ten, we see these guys come through treatment. We see these guys go through our, our AA meetings. This is the place that they're going to stall like a big dog uh, between the third and the fourth step. You with us? They, it's like one of the problems that we see is that we've compartmentalized the steps. We've divided them all up, you know, and, of course, we reinforce it. The steps were put in order for a reason, you know. <laughs> and that's a, but Bill Wilson, exactly has been already pointed out, not to repeat, is, is they give us little instructions after each step telling us to get on down with this thing and finish. After the third step prayer, it says we launched out on the course, obvious what they want us to do. So who gives us the right to sit on our butts for six months? I'm sitting in a meeting not long ago in San Antonio, and this lady says, I don't know why you guys get in such an urgent rush about this. I was two years before I could look even begin to do a fourth step. Wow, again, but this is somebody sharing an opinion with us. The little newcomer goes, phew, I'm with her, you know. And I, <laughs> Except, except again, because this lady may or may not even be one of us. Maybe she could wait two years to do that. But most of this stuff, guys, when I take the alcohol and the dope away from me, the one thing that made me okay inside, I'm going to start coming out like <laughs> Yopala. It's like the spiritual malady comes back when I stop drinking and all that internal discomfort is kicking butt. So if I don't do something to change that, I'm in trouble. I want to mention one thing real quick in the third step. There's a little line down at the bottom that says that God's going to remove our difficulties so that what? So that we can bear witness to God's power to those that we would help. Thy love, thy, you know, with us, you'll remember the line. So that's what that's about. Basically, that third step ob- obligates us to go back into meetings and share hope with a newcomer. You follow? Buddy, your life may become an un- un-by-God raveled. You know how it gets in sobriety sometimes, you know? But you've got one responsibility to go back in that meeting and tell them, give that newcomer some hope. You, you follow? I, I just just visited with a guy about this, and it's like, yes, but but we have problems. You're telling us that we're supposed to lie and to not tell that newcomer that we're in a bad spot. It's pretty much is what I'm saying. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. You got a sponsor. You got some close confidants, some friends. Talk about your stuff. You follow. But in the meeting, we're supposed to be there to pull the newcomer. 
get little guy in the back try to fix it to commit suicide, right? And he didn't know if he wants to stay or not. He's going to sit here and listen to you complain about your day. Do I follow? I'm going to go ahead and say it because I didn't get to say it last night. Primary purpose says that we have one, one primary purpose. I know a lot of y'all disagree because you've had plenty of opportunities. I've done it. Go into a meeting, dump, uh, puke all over the table, let everybody in the room clean it up. Oh, let's just all hug. I feel so much better. How, how cool. You with us? But the little alcoholic in the, or dope, dope fiend sitting in the back didn't get the hope that he needed to stay in the fellowship. Y'all understand where, where I'm at with that? It's, it's, I'm not saying you don't need somebody to talk to. That's what good sponsorship's about. But we've turned this into a a problem-solving thing in our meetings. And again, Charlie said it last night. We should set aside one night a week. No, shit. We'll set aside three nights a week that you can come and whine about your day. Three nights a week you can come talk about me. But the other four nights, we're going to talk about the the power, the solution. How's that sound? Yeah. (laughs) This afternoon we get a chance to talk. And my, my big promotion is to change some formats because the newcomer is going to share the way he's been instructed to share. And if it's in a meeting when everybody's puking, he's going to puke. Make sense? The meeting should be there for him to puke. Anyway, bottom line, because she covered it so great, what we're trying to do in this four-step business, guys, is keep our ego right size. We were talking about it. And uh, I don't know if some of y'all are little... You see the little plus and minus that I wrote? You know, you, you get a little guy coming into the meetings and he's all full of himself, you know, and he's, you know loud and obnoxious and F this and F that, you know, and this guy said, boy, this is a little arrogant little pissant over here, you know, so obviously he's he's full of himself, you follow? And then over at this table sitting all by herself is this lady, and she's all sitting beside it, she's just, just and she's sniffing the whole meeting because she's crying, and, and she didn't want, can I help? No, no, I'm okay, and she's just pushing every, everybody away. You with us? It's all the same thing. It's this ego piece, and the reason I'm saying it, because I know this this one, the, you, underneath this is big V tattooed. I'm the victim from hell. Y'all understand? And I learned it long, long time ago, and it works well. This little guy can use his little brashness to, to keep people at bay, and you can also use the victim stuff to keep them at bay. And I've done it all, you know, I mean, you wouldn't want to go to a bed with a guy with an eye patch. I mean... <laughs> If you play it, if you play it right, guys, and you say it with the right enough sadness, there will be. Well, of course I would. <laughs> she probably won't be the most attractive one in the room, but you'll still get. Y'all, we manipulate the world with this stuff, guys, and that's what Harry T. Belt wrote in the '30s. He talked about this resurgence of the ego. This is why we work and rework the 12 steps so that we can keep this ego right size. You'll follow? How many of you guys have watched people with some sobriety under their belt get so full of themselves they just drank over? You know, they just <laughs> exploded. And it's like, what happened? Their ego got away from them. You'll follow? They started thinking they were something because they had some sobriety under their belt. Oh my gosh. Just, it just, I want to, again, I talked about it last night. I don't want to be worse than you and I don't want to be better than you. I just want to be like you. I just want to be a brother. That's all I want to be. So, we, we were laughing before about p- people that put us on the pedestal. You know, it's a little unnerving to sign a book or get your picture taken. You know, all of a sudden you think you're a rock star. But when people begin to start thinking that, oh my God, well, I'm the first to, to to shoot a hole in that because you you need to hear me because there's no such thing. Y'all understand that? We're all bozos on this bus. Next week y'all can get up and and, and give a talk. It's just you follow. It's just don't put me on a pedestal because I can assure you I'll let you down in the long run. It's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's human condition. And that's what the fourth step does for me. I sit down with this thing and I write this fourth step. The thing I'm going to ask the newcomer to do, just exactly what Katie said. We're going to set an appointment to do a fifth step. Immediately it's going to be a week out and then we're going to give you a week to do this work. Treatment centers have killed us with making this into a big, big, long deal. Y'all know why treatment centers want you to take so long to do a fourth step? Because... <laughs> Come rock on. Come on, brother. Why do I want you to take two days when I can have you do it three weeks and charge you for it? I'm not knocking that. I have more power to you. But what we're trying to do is get down to causes and conditions. This is a fact-finding mission. What I want you to do is get down to the main stuff that's choking you. I don't want you to keep splitting hairs. I get quiet with God and I say, God, show me the people, institutions, and, and principles I'm pissed at. You with me? And all of a sudden, the names stop coming. And then the names stop coming. A couple of days, I'm looking at it, 30, you know, 
a day or so and, and I'm, the name stopped coming and it's like, okay, that's time to start going. Let's go to second step, the third column, fourth column, fifth. Let's finish this business because it's, I'm working on my fourth step. I'm working on my, no, what? You're putting names on the list that you haven't thought of in 30 years. Are you, this is not therapy. We're not looking for deep seated. This is, this stuff is the stuff that we're laying awake at night choking about. You with us? I'd rather see, we're taking an inventory just exactly. I don't take inventory of stuff I've already thrown away six months ago. I'm taking inventory of the stuff that's rotten in the freezer today. That's what I'm looking at. People get, oh, you should see the room change when I did that. I worked for six months on my four step, right? I can't believe the pain of having to listen to that. I understand that. The relief you got was not because you had 400 names on the inventory. The relief you got is because you finished it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I don't, I, you know, I, I hear people, talk, they call us a little, a little autotrons around the steps, you know, and they, they think, well, this has got to be this way, this way. I got to tell you this, folks, because I had lots of talks with Mark about this. I don't care how you work the steps. You're not relapsing because you didn't do a, an extended third column or, a, a you know, a, a, a elongated eight. You, you, you're relapsing because you didn't do the step, period. You'll follow? I didn't do my fourth step right. I just don't think, unless you left a bunch of stuff out that, that you were that conscious of, I don't think that you can screw this up. The book gives you some pretty simple, you know, uh, directions on what to do. Um, I, it's a counselor at, at the place where I worked for years, is he was one of those big deals. If you don't have at least 600 names on your inventory, you're not doing a thorough four-step. Again, it's somebody's opinion. I didn't know 600 people on earth. I mean, I, I didn't... What, you're pissed off at every person you came in contact with? <laughs> Come on, guys. Significant other's going to be on there. Your family's going to be on there. Your employer's going to be on there. The government's going to be on there. You're with us. The cops, maybe, whatever, some institutions. Let's move on with this. I want you to get the big stuff out, and then let's go, you know? I'm going to set up. I'm going to do the, the little inventories, the four columns. I'm going to do a little two column, exactly like Katie said, fear inventory. Sex inventory is real simple. It's got nothing to do with sex. It's got to do with my behavior towards the opposite sex. If you, you follow, if you were doing an inventory out of the book, the way that asking the specific questions of what they're asking you to answer in the book on the sex inventory, I could sit down and hear your fifth step and never blush. And you could do it and never blush. Because we're not talking about pokey pokey. We're talking about how do I treat the opposite sex? That's exactly what this book is. Y'all follow? It's just, buddy, I tell you, guys that come to me says, oh, goody, now we get to do the sex inventory. I say, buddy, yeah, guess who you're going to do it with? You know, when the fifth step comes around, you're going to do that piece with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> kind of change the complexion of the room real quick, you know? <laughs> because when you start thinking about how you treated your sisters in this, it'll take your breath away. Truly, we get to look at that behavior. Yes, your name goes on the inventory. The book says sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. I hear people all the time, don't, don't put your name on the inventory. The book is telling you to put your name on the inventory. A lot of the resentments that I had were against myself for the crap that I pulled. I wasn't hating this, my landlady. I was hating myself for screwing this landlady. And I just, it's like, I got to look at my, my business on that. Y'all with us on that? It's okay. It's remorse and we were sore at ourselves. It's the very top of the page. But I tell you, it's a great place to look at this. Great place to look at this. What we end up with is a completed inventory. And I get with my sponsor. We sit down with a fifth step. And then this, the sponsor, I'm going to say this real quick, is the guy that is that, that speeds this up or slows it down. You follow? Guys, I got to tell you, there's so much misinformation out there about this fifth step. Now, some of you guys that did these 10-hour fifth steps, you're gonna just, just put your hand on your head like this and go, no, 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 for just a few minutes. And then I'll be finished, okay? Oh, my God. Page 62, we've hit it to death. Selfish and self-centeredness is the root of the problem. And now we're going to sit there for 10 hours and talk about me for 10 hours. It's like, come on, guys, let's go. Let's get it done. It's going to be very fast. Once you find your truth in the fourth column, I'm going to go next. No, I don't want to hear the details. I don't want to hear all the stuff. Y'all with us on this? It's not important. I want As long as you see your truth in the fourth column, my part, where have I been selfish? Where have I been fearful? Where have I been dishonest? You with us? Those are the areas I'm looking at. And once I can see that, next, and I'm not going to treat the, 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 the major crime any different than the little petty argument you had with your wife. Next, next, next. And before you know it, what happens, just like with Mark, we're laughing our butts off. That's how you know you're in a healthy fist step. If you're, if you're shrouded in a blanket and y'all have lit some candles and there's lots of tears, you are not in a healthy fist step. <laughs> 
A seance, perhaps. <laughs> I, no, because this is why everybody misunderstands what this is about. Oh my gosh, it was the most traumatic thing I did. Why? Looking at your truth? Y'all under, understand, we're not going to swim in it. I just want you to see your truth so we can move on and not do it again. How cool is this? Come on, guys, we just move through it real quick. We get to the other side. We get to hug next, and we get to move on. You with us? Just, just, oh. It says an hour later, we're going to go back through the first proposals, exactly what Katie said. An hour later, we're going to do six and seven. Real quick, guys, when I'm sitting there doing a fist step with a guy, I got a piece of paper in front of me, and I divide it in two, and a little piece of paper, and I, and I put, I put uh, uh, eight step on one side, and I put six step on the other side. You with us? And as this guy's giving me his fist step, because this is what the book says, while we do this fist step, I'm pulling some character defect. I'm hearing this guy, got his arrogance, jealousy. Anytime you're judging somebody, you're being selfish. Do y'all agree? I think I know what that person do. And so selfish is always down there, fearfulness. And I'm making a list of the six step character defects. I'm also making a list of people that I think perhaps maybe he owes amends to. It's not something we're going to discuss now, but I'm helping him with this eight step list. He says, while we did our fifth step, we get this list. You follow? So after this is over, we're ready to go. He's going to go home for, for an hour. He's going to sit quiet with God, go through the first proposals, make sure that he hadn't left off anything. You know, like how many times have we done a fifth step? And the guy calls back and says, listen, about that chicken, you know? Yeah. And it's, oh, okay. Because <laughs> he wasn't going to say anything, and now he's finally, okay, that's fine. And that's what that was about. And then we go to God in six and on the seventh step. You with us? Again, I hear people, they do these weekend workshops on six and seven. Jesus, book, God, the book is, is two paragraphs. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'm going to ask God to remove the character defects that stand in the way of, of you and me and my usefulness to you and God and my fellows and others. The, the character defects. And I, I think I know what I want God to remove, and God may not remove that. You with us? Guys, I've said it from a gazillion podiums. I've asked God to make me a, a very quiet, sensitive young man. Because I, I had a counselor one time that could just sit and was very nice, and he never raised his voice, and hmm, oh, hmm, he hmmed a lot. And I remember him, and I, but it was a kind of a nice deal, and he never took any errors, and he never pissed anybody. He just, hmm, nice, hmm. That's what I'd like to be like that guy. You with me? It just never has happened. <laughs> Ravala? Some people need hugging. That's the beauty of this program is that some of you guys get to work with people and you're as kind and gentle as you can possibly be and God's going to use that in you. And sometimes you just need to be a, <laughs> roughed up a bit and that God's going to use me to do that. And that's just how that, that's how it works. But God's changed me a lot, guys, in, in the last 10 years. I can tell you, the character defects, it continues to, to work on that. I hear people in meetings all the time. And, and listen, if you're saying this in a meeting, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Please, don't say it anymore because you sound so stupid when you say it. Don't say it. I don't want to do. I don't want to do six and seven because if I give God all my character defects, I don't know who I'll be. Don't say that. Don't. I'm, don't say that. Just say I pass. Just say. Just say I pass. Let me be the first to tell you what you will be. Better. <laughs> Some of you are grinding your teeth because you're saying it in meetings today. I, come on, guys. It's, it's just, it, it just absolutely takes the breath away. Y'all understand this? Good God. Katie said it last night and referred to it. This four-step business, fifth-step business, this is not about confession, folks. I think there's a, a wonderful piece of this that letting another man into your life or another woman into your life and, and sharing some, some truth about yourself. There's a, there's, a, there's a piece of that that's very very uplifting and very, very healing in lots of ways when we find out we're not alone. But guys, if this was just about confession, you with me? Then, then, I mean, the churches would have a lot more sober people out there because the churches have been doing confession for years. It has not changed us. One of the big movements in, in Texas uh, for a long time was don't do fist steps with people in the in meetings. Do fist steps with priests or people that can't tell anybody. I remember a guy in a meeting one time says, I went to, a, to the bus station and got up, found a bum and did my fist step with him because I knew I'd never see him again. Well, I bet he found a lot of truth out in that fist step talking to this bum. You with us? If it was just about confession, I suppose that would have sufficed. But that's not what this is about. You with us? I need a sponsor to, to help me see my truth in that fourth column because exactly what they were saying earlier, sometimes I can't see my stuff. You with us? Well, I don't know what I've done wrong here. And a sponsor can show you. A, an outside entity, unaffected by what's going on, can clearly point out in the fourth column what your part was.
that that makes sense? And we just get a chance to do it. I think somebody in the program, that's why I disagree with doing fist steps in treatment. I think fist steps should be done with the sponsor in the fellowship. We don't need to be doing AA's work for them. Thank you very much. It doesn't do any good for me to be down in Hunt, Texas and do a fist step with somebody that's going back to Ontario. Why? I'll never, I may never see them again. I know them better than their own family knows them because of the fist step. But I can't see them with us. And they come into the meeting, hair standing straight out, eyes look like, like zombies, you know, and it's like, oh, oh my shit, what's wrong? You know, but I'm not there. I'm in Texas. Y'all understand that? Just, it, I think it, it means something important to, uh, to be across from somebody. What takes place after that, uh, I don't know about you guys, I didn't see any wild sparks when I did a fist step. Um, but I'll tell you what did happen to me after I finished it. I um, left my sponsor's house and for the first time felt a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I felt like I was not on the sidelines talking about something that I'd actually done something. I knew a lot more about myself, and an hour later I had a clear idea of the character defects. But the coolness of it was I got to be a part of this. Um, I thought she was talking to me. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. I know. I know, I know, I know. I know. So, uh, again, the biggest mistake we make is we try to make this thing too, too complicated. And the truth of the matter is you can't screw it up. Six months from now, you want to, you, some other stuff starts to percolate up, sit down with a piece of paper, jot it down. I go through a fourth and fifth step a, a year so I can keep current. I also do 10th step stuff, but I stay really current on fourth and fifth step. And it's pretty cool. I usually sit down with one of the guys I'm sponsoring. And he does a little fifth step with me and I do a little fifth step with him and we get to know each other a little bit better. And we just move on down the road. It's just it's called staying current in the work. And I guarantee it'll crack you like an egg if you do that. Oh, cool. Why don't we you want to do, a little, do that and then we'll go smoke real quick and we'll come back and do this. We're just kind of scatter shooting here a little bit and, and uh, you can tell we're not working off of a, a format or note cards and stuff. So I, I like to go back through and hit on, on some of the points that we're, we're talking about, but uh, you know, it's funny. Chris talked about uh, some of the stuff that you hear in the meetings, and you know, one of the things that I'm always looking at, if I'm doing meeting-based sobriety, there's things that I'm going to hear in the fellowship of AA. I don't, I don't know, if, maybe they don't say this up here, but one of the things that drives me crazy is when I hear people in the rooms go, well, you know, this is a selfish program. Have, have you have you heard that? I mean, is that is that yeah? You know, like, well, and, you know, and if if I'm the new guy, and I hear that three or four times in an AA meeting, what am I going to think? I'm going to think it's AA, you know, because I heard it in an AA meeting, and they said, you know, it's a selfish program, and, and if it's a selfish, program, I can't find that anywhere in the book. I can't find anywhere in the book where it says this is a selfish program. And, you know, so that's where I think we run into trouble. You know, it's all about reduction of self. And it's like, take away my difficulties. Why? So I can chill and watch a hockey game? It's like, no, I said, I changed that. I usually say a football game. I would never watch a hockey game. <laughs> um, but, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, I just, I don't, I, I don't know. I'd have to be sponsored. I'd have to be sponsored through a hockey game. I don't, you know, but. But it doesn't say take away my difficulties so I'll feel better. It says so the victory over them can help other people who have had the same difficulty. You know, and when it talks about, you know, uh, removing my, you know, all that stuff is about so I can be of service and be of service and be of service. Even when it's making me feel better, it's so I can be of service. So that's why we get nervous. When, when you, if the problem is self, if my real problem is based in self, and, and it, you know, I got self on me so much. You know, the problem with being when we talk about being blind to self, when you get a guy like me to try to look for self, it's like trying to ask a fish to search for water. I, I, I can't, I, I can't see self because it's on me. You know, like like that monster in Aliens. You know, I mean, but one of my favorite examples is one time I walked in the A Club and there was a guy sitting in the card room. And I swear to God, I'll never get. He goes, "Hey, Charlie, how you doing?" I go, "Hi, it's good. Man. How you doing?" He goes, "We need to go back to Vegas sometime." And I go, "Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, we do, man, right on." And I walked out of the room. And I go, "I got zero recollection of ever being in Vegas with this guy, <laughs> you know." And I'm then we're talking about like 15 years sober, and it took me a while to figure it out. And the reason that I didn't remember being in Vegas with this guy 
is because I wasn't in Vegas with this guy. I was in Vegas with me. <laughs> and this guy and, and this guy just happened to be there. You know? But I'm like, where are you, Steve? I don't you know, I, I can't you know, and, and that's that's the way my whole life is. I mean, we could st we could talk up here for hours about how self-centered I am. But you know, the new guy a lot of times can't hear it. But my God, as you, well, I call it the second surrender in Alcoholics Anonymous. The first surrender is the surrender to drugs and alcohol, and that one's usually pretty easy because it comes fresh off an ass whipping. You know, it's real easy to surrender when I've been beat down. But this surrender to self. A lot of times it doesn't come for a while until I've tried to do this deal sober for a while and I'm hitting the wall with self-will. And if I'm lucky, i got somebody in my life going, you're running up against manifestations of self. That's what blew up that marriage. That's why you're overdone at the bank. That's what blew up that business. You know, and, and Because otherwise I'll back off and then I'll take another run at it with self-will and I'll hit the wall again and a couple of years later and spend that sort of thing. So when we hear a guy saying, I want to put myself on my inventory... It makes me a little nervous sometimes because if it is a disease based in self, who's the first one I'm going to want to put on my resentment list? Me. And what happens when we get to the ninth step, the amends list? Who's the first one I want to make amends to? How about me? You know, I mean, maybe a new Cadillac would make me feel better. But, you know, you know so, so I'm always like, we're going to get to that one a little bit later. But, but the thing I wanted to come back is that in the inventory one of the things that I missed for a long time is I understood we talk a lot about the mechanics of how to do an inventory, but some of the real power in these in the inventory process lies in these prayers that are scattered throughout the inventory process. And I've never there's one in particular that I've never seen one fourth step guide that that addresses, and it's 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 the resentment prayer at the bottom of page sixty six. And it talks about when we're between the third column, and it's no coincidence that it's between the third column and the fourth column. Because in the first column, I'm talking about who hurt me. In the second column, I'm talking about what they did. And in the third column, I'm talking about how it affected me. And I've been doing that on bar stools for a long time, talking about who I'm pissed at, what they did, and how it affected me. But if we're going to roll into what we're going to do now, is going to, we've, I've got to recenter my spirit, and I've got to change it. Well, I love the way Katie usually says, it says in the book, we were prepared to look at the list from an entirely different angle. And she's the only one I ever heard that, was, that will sit the guy down and go, are you ready to look at this from an entirely different mm -hmm. angle? You know, because am I or am I not? Because I know this angle. All right? I've been looking at this angle for a while, but now all of a sudden we get to this prayer and it says we realize that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. But we didn't like their symptoms, which is uh, column two, and the way they disturbed me, which is column three. They, like me, were sick too. And you know, you hear a lot about praying for the person you resent. It's not what it says in the book. It says it back in one of the stories. But what it says here is I'm asking God to help me show them the same pity, tolerance, pity, and patience that I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And pity, if you look up in an old dictionary, doesn't mean this condescending, bless his little heart type of thing. It, it, it means compassion and, and empathy. You know, So I need a lot of slack when I screw up. But when I screw up, it's all run through my motives. And my delusion, I knew what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to hurt anything. I was just trying to, you know, you know. But when you screw up, it is outrageous. Right? Are you with me on that? You know, because, you know, we'll, we'll you know, we'll give no quarter on that, you know. But so now it's going, am I willing to give them the same kind of slack that I, that I want when I screw up, you know? And, and it's saying, ask God to give me that same tolerance, pity, and patience in it. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell that story about Roy. I was sponsoring a guy that had a, um, a resentment against his father. His mother was crazy, and they'd had a lot of problems with his mother. And and, uh, and one day, uh, Roy's dad came home, and Roy was sitting on the front porch, and there were two other brothers, and he goes, your mom killed herself today. And he, and he walked on into the house. And Roy was so pissed off about how could his dad 
be that heartless. I mean, how could he just dump that on him like that and walk out of the house? And we're doing a force. He's told me I can tell this story. And uh, there's some powerful stuff in these prayers. I'm doing an inventory with him, and we get to this fourth column, and I go, Roy, you know, when he talks about being inconsiderate, for me, the reason I say inconsiderate is because I never considered it. I was like, did you ever consider that your dad was like a 40-year-old man at this time? His wife has been putting him through hell. She's been in and out of mental institutions. She's been talking about hurting herself for a long time. And on this day, his wife had committed suicide. He comes home now. He's got a wife who just committed suicide. He's got to plan a funeral. He's got to tell the family. He's got to tell everybody about it. And he's got to figure out how he's going to work a job and raise three kids by himself. And is it possible that on that day, given his tools and his background and what he had to deal with, is it possible that he was doing the best he could? And uh, Roy goes, never occurred to me for a second. I never gave one thought to what my dad was going through that day. All of my childhood memories are of me. I don't have, that's when we talk about being selfish and self centered. And when he sat there and looked at it that way, I said, Are you willing to grant your dad the same patience and tolerance that you would grant yourself if you were going through that? Is it possible he was doing the best he could? And I watched as a result of this prayer a 42 year old resentment melt away that day. When Katie talks about the fourth column, turning the second column into a lie, it is magic stuff. I mean, this is stuff that has been driving me for my whole life. And all of a sudden, if I got a good sponsorship through this fourth column, not some bum that speaks a foreign language at the bus stop, if I got somebody pointing out this stuff to me, my God, the magic that can happen in this stuff as a result of these prayers. So when I do the fourth column, in between the third column and the fourth column, I've got a little place for a check mark. For this guy to put down, did you do that prayer at the bottom of page 66? Are you willing to look at your ex-wife with the same tolerance you would grant her if she had uh, some sort of brain damage? or what? It, you, know, you know how if somebody says F you to me and they, they got Tourette's syndrome, you go, oh, well, bless his heart. You know, the stuff just blurts out of him. But boy, you let, you let it, you know, other, the circumstances, am I willing to grant this person that tolerance? And, Before And the other thing I wanted to talk about is in the fear inventory. If we're looking at manifestations of self, how does self block me? How does self show up for me? I love the thing, and Katie talked about it, in this fear thing is this fear of control. You know, The reason when we get to look at this, and all I like to point out, I don't do a big four or five column inventory with a guy in the fear list. He talks about we listed our fears. And we asked ourselves why we had them. The main bulk of the, because sometimes I see people doing these 900 page fear inventories, and I think the illusion or the delusion is that we can gather enough information about our fears that one day we'll be able to manage them. Right? If my life is based on self, can I get enough information about these fears and get enough knowledge, you know, and, and analysis that I can handle this fear? That's not what the book is going to imply. What the book is telling me is that. In me trying to manage them, I got no shot. So the main thing he needs to see in that fear inventory is that he's got them and that it's the failure of self-reliance, right? Because if I'm relying on me to control everything, there's this little sphere of control that I have. These are the little things that I can control in my life. What kind of sandwich I'm going to have, where I'm going to sit. There's a few little areas that I have control over, right? But, there are things that are way outside my, and it's amazing how many times when you're doing a fear inventory with somebody, if you sit them down and you go, okay, this little area of control, this fear you just wrote down here, inside your area of control or outside your area of control? They go, okay. Whether you're going to get cancer, is that inside or outside your control? They go, outside. Whether your wife's going to leave you or not, inside or outside? They go, well, it's outside of my area of control. The things that are outside of my area of control or what scares me, because I know at some level, when I'm living a life based on self, that I can't control that. So that's where God comes in real handy, is in all those areas. And if I've made this deal back in step three that I'm going to quit playing God, the most beautiful part of that is where I go, you know what, I am no longer in management. And that is a management level decision. Whether or not I'm going to get cancer, God, you know, 
Mark Houston dying of a stomach aneurysm was not my idea, and I don't think it was his. But if I'm out of the God business, it's like, you know, that, that decision is above my pay grade, you know? And so all this stuff that I'm trying to get scared about is the stuff that i got to give over to God because it says, wasn't it because self-reliance failed me? So fear is always the failure of, self-reliance. And then we get down to this prayer here where it says on 68 we're now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that I do as I think he would have me. Where'd Bruce go? Remember when we were talking about, you know, if I just do what I think God would have me do and humbly rely on him, and rely on means to lean on with confidence. If I lean on God with confidence that he's going to run this deal better than I can do it, he'll enable me to match calamity with serenity. And then when we get down here and it says, instead we let God demonstrate through us what he can do. So when if I'm doing it, looking at the difference between God reliance and self-reliance, this is amazing. We use a 1936 dictionary. It's primary purpose group, and we look up a lot of words. And to see what they meant at the time they were writing the big book, shot was one when it says fear, uh, the fabric of our existence was shot through with it. I thought, well, I know what shot means. When we looked it up in the 1936 dictionary. It says a method of weaving using warp and web where the fabric takes on a different appearance depending upon the viewpoint of the observer. And I'm like, Mark used to call them Cheech and Chong moments, where the whole room goes, whoa. <laughs> you know? And, and, the thing, and this thing about let God demonstrate through me what he can do. You know what demonstrate means when you look it up in the dictionary? It says to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. To prove to the point where the opposite viewpoint is rendered absurd. So if I let God do this deal, it says he'll prove that God reliance works beyond a shadow of a doubt, he can prove it to the point that it makes self-reliance look absurd. But the thing with all of us is I always think that God's going to jip me a little bit. Am I the only one that feels that way? That if I turn my life over to God, that now, you know, that, that he's going to put me in God's clothes with a bullhorn and a Bible down at the corner, you know? Or that, or that God's going to jip me. I always feel like I can get myself a little bit better deal than God's going to give me although I have very little evidence to prove that that has worked out very well. And there's been a lot of times where I've gotten, didn't get what I want, and it turned out to be pretty cool. And there's also been times where I got what I wanted, and it was awful. So I'm not necessarily even a good gauge of what I need, but I'm hesitant to turn this deal over. So when when we talk about being convinced that my life run on self will, it's the book is going to take me back to that and back to that and back to that. It's going to restate that third step deal over and over and over again through the work and by reminding ourselves many times, you know, each day, Thy will not mine be done. And reminding ourselves we're no longer running the show. It's going to keep taking me back to that deal I made with God in step three about, you know, I got to quit playing God and. You know, stay close to him and perform his work well. So, you know, those are just some little scatter points on uh, on the inventory process. But, you know, after that fifth step, it gives us some direction on who we're going to do it with and the requirements they need to be able to hear my fifth step. It says it's important that you be able to keep a confidence, that he fully understand and approve what I'm driving at, and he'll not try to change my plan. Those are the three requirements, you know, for hearing a fifth step. And then it talks about how we roll into it. But I love the way Katie talked about the, those fifth step promises. But Mark Houston changed that hour for me. He gave a talk one time at my kitchen table. I think I probably caught about 5% of what he was saying that night. And that 5% revolutionized my look at this whole hour. I used to just kind of go home and sit for a while and maybe read a little of the book and stuff. And I mean, he went on a rant. Have you ever heard him do that? With this? Whew, this guy could bring it. And I mean, um, 
he talked about going home and taking this book down and going over these first five steps and all their implications. You know, everything that it looks like. Do I believe that I have a hopeless condition of mind and body? Do I know what it means to be an alcoholic? Do I have a physical allergy coupled with a mental obsession? Do I believe that my only shot is this power? And have I made a deal with this power? Do I know what the deal is in step three? You know, am I convinced? Am I convinced that my life, do I act like a guy that's convinced? What would that guy look like? What would it look like if you followed a guy around that's convinced that his life run on self-will would hardly be a success? Would you have to press that guy to do an inventory? Would you have to make that guy call his sponsor? Or if he's convinced, he's going to be going, what do I do next? You know, I did what you told me. What do I do next? So, you know, all that stuff, and I'm taking it in there. And have I done an inventory? Have I, have I looked at the things in my path that are blocking me? And have I really shared that? Have I left anything out? I mean, it's on and on and on because then we roll into six and seven. And, you know, at Primary Purpose Group in Austin, we close our meetings with the seventh step prayer because I think it's the purest AA prayer. And it doesn't come from anywhere else. It doesn't have any Christian influence or outside influence or stuff. So at our meeting every day, you know, we close with my creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, the good and the bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. You know, and it's like, then we've done step seven. But I mean, the problem was when I'd done a fourth step that was just a confession, I had squat to take into six and seven. But when I've done a real fourth column, and I've had a sponsor that's just sitting there, sitting there pounding me with, selfishness, dishonesty, fearful, you know, inconsiderate, self-seeking, all that stuff over and over and over. And it's in this resentment and this resentment and this resentment and this resentment. Now i got real stuff to take into six and seven and go, God, help me be less of that. Help me be more like this. You know, it wasn't just some bullshit uh, churchy sounding step. It was like, my God, i am really got all this new awareness of this stuff from the fifth step, and God help me be less like that, and give me the strength to be more like you want me to be. Does that, does that make sense? Katie, does you want to tie anything up? Do you want to do any Q&A? Let's, we got about five minutes for Q&A. And I want to thank you guys, because I know what it's like to try to listen right after you eat. I nod out like I'm on methadone right after I eat. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, so uh, I, I I appreciate y'all hanging in there, but anybody got any questions for for anything we've just covered? I think he asked, the question was, what about steel on steel? And that's something I think we're going to have to talk about outside the, after the meeting or something. Steel on steel, short version, is an accountability format that Mark came up with, and it is a way for people that are really, you know, if they have spiritual consent with each other, to check how you're doing, you know, and, and with the, but you got to have a crew of guys that you feel really comfortable about, you know, sharing that stuff with. And I, I, I'm a big fan of it, but it's a little bit outside what we're, we're talking about here. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. The question is, or what she's saying is that she knows you're supposed to get out of self and help others, but some people say you don't have anything to give yet. Um, I've got guys that at two months are sponsoring other guys. You know, and once a guy has gone through this work and had that spiritual awakening, I had a guy call me and goes, they said at the meeting today that you've got to have a year of sobriety to sponsor. And I said, what does the step say? I said, first of all, we don't go against group conscience. If they say their group conscience decision is we don't, you can't sponsor, then don't stand up when they talk about sponsors. But away from that, what does the step say? And he goes, well, it says having had a spiritual awakening. I said, have you had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And he goes, absolutely. I said, do you think there's anybody that was in that noon meeting today that has over a year of sobriety that has not had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps? And he goes, yeah, probably. And I go, probably about half of them. You know, if you've had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, to me, you're ready to carry the message. And even if you're still going through the process, if you got 10 days, you got something to tell a new guy, you know? And if and, and there's a lot of forms of that stuff, but I uh, I mean, I don't think I don't find anywhere in the book where it says you got to have X amount of time before you're ready. If you if you, you know, I like to get a guy through the work, and I mean, I've had guys, I've had more than I've had several guys that I can think of that had a couple of months of sobriety 
Well, that is a sponsor. And it's funny because sometimes you see guys sometimes and they're going, well, I kind of really was thinking of somebody with a little more time, you know. And, and um, I, But the other thing is I always tell people when you're looking for a sponsor, and we'll get to this in the 12th step, I think it's a fair question to go, have you had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps? Because you know, the guy that goes, well, I'm like, Rock on, dude. Um, I'm, I'm going to go get some coffee, you know. But um, did that answer? Uh, I just, yeah, I mean, because people, well, yeah, here comes Chris. Bottom page 129. We'll talk about it in the last hour up here. we got one, one more to go, but look on the bottom page 129. So, you know, you know, some great chapters we were talking earlier. Some of these are forgotten. They call them the forgotten chapters because we just skip over them a lot of times. It's, but it's, it's some wonderful stuff in the family after and chapter of the wives. They've got even less couple of sentences in this. It says, even if he displays a certain amount of neglect and irresponsibility towards the family, it is well to let him go as far as he likes in helping other alcoholics. During those first days of convalescence, this will do more to ensure his sobriety than anything else. You see, see where we're at? Yeah. Yeah. For, for years, what they did, the standard procedure in Texas was, you know, you come in and you sit and you go to 90 meetings in 90 days and you just, you know, you, you, you depend on the fellowship to kind of keep you sober. But what happens when Chris Framer, the, the pain starts to go away and I'm sitting there with us and everybody's talking and sharing some really good stuff. I ain't listening. I ain't hearing a thing anybody's saying. All I'm thinking about is all the crazy stuff going on in my life. And I'm just so turned inward. And the deal is, is that this last time after that suicide attempt, they said, Chris, come on, help us, help us carry this message. And I said, we, so he said, we're going to go to the halfway house tonight. And I said, buddy, I don't think I'm ready to share in, in the halfway house. He said, no, we didn't ask you to share. We asked you to bring the books, you know, so like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but y'all understand what we're talking about here. And, this is, and in the process of doing that, I'm sitting in there. And a little guy slides up to me and I start telling him a little bit about my story and, and about how, you know what I'm saying? And we're talking and visiting. And I'll, all of a sudden I leave that place feeling a part of what we're doing here. That's the that's the that's the thing that separates the room is that there's people that feel a part of the fellowship and people that are just coming by for a visit and it's like buddy until you start doing the the actual work twelve step stuff you're not going to understand what this is about huh yeah I will tonight I will just I will I won't take time out but that answers the question if you think you can help somebody help somebody we hear it in treatment non until the cows come home you're too sick to even help yourself how how can you expect to help anybody else as you. <laughs> hold that thought you're pretty close to the truth there you know that's it's pretty good go work with somebody and you'll you'll it'll blow you out of the water who else real quick everybody needs to smoke you're good what you got we're gonna hit it hard from the last hour of this the book says we tried to carry this message we, we're rampant in texas everybody's sitting around waiting for the newcomer to come in you know and it's like that's not what bill ebby did. didn't do that ebby got on a bus and found bill wilson bill wilson didn't just sit there in a meeting waiting for somebody he, he went to to uh, he connected a bunch of dots and found Dr. Bob. And, you know, they it took effort to do this. And if you go out of your way to do that, you, absolutely, absolutely, wherever you can help. You'll never know who you're going to help. Guys, you might not see immediate results. The guy that took that showed me where that meeting was, where I finally got sober, did it three years earlier. And I looked at him and said, I ain't ever going to go into that meeting, you know, because I'm not ready yet. You know what I'm saying? And three years later, by God, I was ready and knew exactly where to go. That's a pretty cool deal. Anybody else? Y'all ready to go smoke? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and answer it anyway, guys, because it's a tough one. You're going to get asked the same question. Listen, guys, pe pe people are victimized every day. Pe it's just some of you guys, the stuff that you've been through, it's a wonder that any of us are alive. You follow? But the truth of the matter is, you look in that fourth column, there's a piece of that. Most of this is around secrets and how dishonesty. If you can see one little spot of this that you might have changed or been able to, to, did you share this with anybody? Did you go to an adult? Did you talk to them about that? No, absolutely. Well, there was some fear in there, right? This, yes, there was some fear in there. And you check that off, and that's the little piece you look at and you move on. People believe that the fourth column is all about, what well, it's, it's our part, our mistakes. I understand that. But if you can see a little piece of that, 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 that you perpetuated this, then, then you, can, you can get free of it. This is not about... This is not about justice. This is about mercy. And a lot of this stuff starts to come out in that little piece. And so if you can start seeing it, of course it wasn't that person's fault. They got, got hurt as a child. Y'all understand this? In subsequent years, when did that happen? 40 years ago, and you've been carrying it 40 years and haven't talked to anybody? That's exactly right. Don't you see that there's a little place in here where you could take some responsibility? Could you have owned it? Could you have gotten cleaned up? Could you have gone to somebody that knew, oh my God, bless your heart. We're not blaming anybody. 
But at that point, you can get free of the resentment. And people say, you've never, then, but try it. And then you can see what we're talking about. This, again, this is about freedom, folks. And it's a, there's some tough stuff that we get to look at. You with us? But I don't give that one any more attention than I do the shoplifting at the HEB store. Make sense? We just go next, next, next. We're looking at truth. Truth. We're not looking at drama. Horrible as it was, we're not looking at that. We're not trained to do that. We're looking at just truth here. Make sense? Y'all good? Let's go smoke. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.